Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The recent focus on Russia's war against Ukraine and China's militant move against a perceived threat to the status quo in Taiwan reflected a reality and vision several years ago in American defense planning. The world has reverted to a game of nations. States and governments, not movements and organizations, operate and interact. This is why the targeted killing of Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in his Kabul apartment, which was less than a safe house, seemed as a relic from a bygone era. But is that really so? Has the campaign against Islamic terror in its various manifestations become a footnote to major headlines? Or is it just that public attention has shifted elsewhere and the real war conducted by intelligence agencies and special forces goes on unrelenting? With us to explore this issue are Colonel in Reserve Miri Eisen, who is a TV7 Powers in Play panelist, an Israeli public diplomacy, security and intelligence expert at ICT at Lechman University. Thank you for joining us, Miri. Also joining us is Brigadier General in Reserve uh, Doron Gavish, who is the former Air Defense Chief of uh, the Israeli Air Force and also frequently uh, graces us as a panelist at TV7 Powers in Play. Thank you for joining us as well, Doron. Pleasure to be here. And of course, our TV7 editor at large uh, and host of Powers in Play, Watchmen Talk, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, uh, it is clear to us also last week as a reminder of uh, the ongoing war against uh, Islamic terror with uh, the uh, uh, brief yet uh, decisive altercation between Israel and the Iranian proxy Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Nevertheless, uh, it seems like this has become a side note to major competitions between uh, great powers, of course, uh, the uh, subsidiaries thereof. Give us a little bit of an understanding. To what degree is the side note actually part of the bigger picture? So uh, you have touched on uh, a strategic issue and an operational one. And they are not separate, but one uh, still has to distinguish between the two. The strategic issue is whether, if one looks from the Pentagon towards the world, one, the United States, has to contend with what they call near peers, China and Russia. And we have seen uh, recently, uh, uh, even as we speak now, that Ukraine and Taiwan are the main dishes um, in this uh, uh, course of events. What happened some 20 years ago was that because of 9-11, the entire defense planning of the United States had to shift from contending with these countries, even though um, in the decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they had more time to change uh, course in the United States, to, uh, to cut budgets, to transform and so on. But nevertheless, they had to uh, go on the attack against Al-Qaeda and what they considered one of the host countries in addition to Afghanistan under the Taliban, and that is Iraq. And more recently, uh, they announced that this is over, and now again their um, targets are China and Russia. The operational issue is how to go about fighting terror whether one should be on site, one has to put boots on the ground, or whether this is detrimental because by having boots on the ground, you have more targets for the terrorists and more motivation for the terrorists. And therefore, it is better for you to work offshore. Um, as President Biden uh, now, uh, of course, uh, proudly says, we have managed to get a Zawahiri without being in Kabul. It is better for us. And um, there was an interesting uh, conversation uh, with uh, one of the leaders of the Bin Laden raid, who said, yes, technology has evolved so much that now one can send a drone without endangering SEALs and other special forces and leaving a helicopter behind, as was the case uh, at Abu Dhabi um, in 2011. So to sum it all up, yes, there are residual fights against terror organizations, uh, Islamic Jihad, but they are being contended mostly 
by fire and not by maneuver forces. Colonel Eisen, your take? We're looking at it through the military strategic eyes. I want to broaden it just for a moment. Who are the people who are joining these organizations? It's not just about targeting the top level. It's about the fact that they still can recruit and they still have a relatively strong statement in recruiting for a younger generation in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, and for me as an Israeli in Lebanon, let alone within the Palestinian arena. So when I look at that global fight against terrorism, I think that outside of Israel that actually borders it and it's within us, the other ones are looking at it through the eyes of the leaders. I'm still looking at the challenge that we have, that there are no alternatives, viable alternatives, alternatives that make you proud and interested beyond these horrific, violent terror organizations that when they're recruiting, they're not saying, hey, let's be sadists and go kill people. They're recruiting disenfranchised youth who do not have a future, who view this as being not something... Only. Uh, we see recruitments in universities. We see them in higher education all over the world. Um, disenfranchised youth who have no future can be <clears throat> at universities. Mm -hmm. When they look at the leadership within the countries that they're in, when they look at the values in their sense of a value system which is based in Islam and a lot of what we're talking about we're talking right now about Islamic terrorism but we also should remember that within Islam there is not just terror and this recruitment comes out of very strong aspect within that of being in something that connects you that gives you a stronger sense and it worries me that we don't yet hear in Islam, a viable alternative, something that gives hope, something that gives that youth, which really feels it has no future, a different way to look towards the future. General Gavish? Well, the thing that I would add to it is, um, you know, one of the question is when you're fighting the terror, what is your goal? Are you going to eliminate the terror or, or something else? And I think that the world is moving toward containing the, the terror. And this also um, influenced the way that the, on the operational side, the, uh, the world is fighting against it. So it's not both on the ground so much as it was in the past. Uh, so I think this probably is something that is interesting to say from a strategic point of view. I think that the trend is more containing the terror uh, and not really eliminate it. Uh, because unfortunately, you know, the, the efforts that in order to eliminate the, or the efforts that should be put into it are uh, very challenging for the world because it has so many other challenges to deal with. Uh, so I, this is my, my take on this. No, absolutely. As uh, Mr. Ogan also said, there was a pivot towards the strategic competition. Nevertheless, when we look at the disengagement of the United States from Afghanistan. There was a whole discussion about over the horizon capabilities, the necessity to utilize those advanced capabilities in order to pinpoint target the various terror leaders and then uh, try and dissuade others from being recruited into those organizations. Nonetheless, we heard director uh, of the Central Intelligence Agency, William Burns, speaking about the inability to effectively attain qualitative intelligence in order to execute unless there are boots on the ground, something that, of course, is not completely out there because, as uh, we know now, Ada Wahiri was in an apartment of a Taliban leader while uh, he was uh, targeted. Nonetheless, it is much more difficult and demands more resources. But, but let me uh, remind you, we have recently <clears throat> seen, as you uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, weekend war. It wasn't uh, really a war, um, not even a campaign, <clears throat> just uh, an operation. But um, for the uh, sake of alliteration, let, let's call it the weekend war. There was some fear on the uh, Israeli side uh, some uh, 17 years ago when Israel left Gaza that uh, the Israeli intelligence operation vis-a-vis -vis those assets remain remaining in Gaza on the uh, human dimension of, uh, of um, intelligence, spying, spy running, that this is going to be impaired. And indeed, at first, there was a problem because if the case officer cannot meet with his or her uh, asset, there's a problem. You have to rely more on SIGINT, signal intelligence or other 
other methods. And the Israeli intelligence operation um, run by Shabak, by the Internal Security Agency, suffered for a while. And what we have seen with the excellent intelligence operation only a few days ago is that apparently they have managed to get over this problem. And you can, even though Mr. Burns is probably uh, correct regarding his own agency, uh, apparently there are methods to get excellent, actionable intelligence, even if you don't meet your asset person to person. Colonel Eisen? I'm looking at Amir right now, and I'm thinking of this transition in intelligence from what was always that human intelligence, we need to meet and talk to each other, to the type that we have today, where at the end, every single one of us constantly, with our phone in our pocket, without thinking about it, have our own little both weapon, but also detector inside our pocket. So I'm gonna leave the, the telephone outside the, the room. Having said that, one of the most interesting aspects in the development is how 11 years ago, when they took out Osama bin Laden, it was because it was the only person in the only house that did not have that kind of communication so that you can do the opposite effect. Who isn't using that? What are they going to go back to? Um, birds in the sky with some kind of different type? Weaponry nowadays, for the terrorists to be effective, they too need to gather intelligence, to pinpoint. They want to use effective weapons against us. These are all different channels where we can follow them better. I want to be clear, we haven't stopped terrorism. We're much more effective, way more effective. But I go back to that aspect that there still is a strong pull where people, young people especially, are drawn into these places because they see them as being effective, as being powerful, as giving honor. And I want to try and change that narrative too in that sense. Not having boots on the ground may or may not change that narrative. Well, there are plenty of studies that uh, go either way, but yes. I'd like to ask you... You mean the image of occupation the or, image of, or of foreign interference? Again, and on the other mm -hmm. side, the aspect of the United States of America leaving Afghanistan the way they did, and that gives a sense of, look how when I have the power, it gives me honor on the ground. That actually brings in more recruits for the Taliban than for anything else. Nonetheless, recruits are not only from the Middle East, they also are in the West, they're Absolutely. in Australia, they're uh, everywhere, and what... We we can see as Adha Wahiri initially emerged out of the Muslim Brotherhood, an organization that is exclusively active in Western societies, trying to gather and recruit within Western universities and mosques and so on and so forth. Is this something that uh, can be challenged to a certain degree, considering the fact that most of those organizations, they're one and the same, just uh, different strategies to the same tactics? Well, well, uh, you know, going back to the technology uh, discussion that was, you know, I completely agree with what was said by uh, by uh, Miri. You know, um, those that are being recruited, uh, it, it, they are doing it on the media. They are talking to each other. Uh, the intelligence can uh, can be much more precise than it was in the past because, you know, the, the terrorist organization are using basically the same platforms that we are using. They are talking on the Telegram, they are talking on the on the Facebook and, and whatever they uh, they are doing. So from, from this point of view, if we're going to the technology perspective, I think that uh, we are in a position that uh, we as the West, we can, we can take an advantage of it and use it for our own benefits when we fight uh, against uh, terrorism. Uh, the other thing that uh, I would like uh, to say, talking about strategies of fighting uh, terrorism, and this is going back to what happened in Israel uh, a week ago, is really, um, do you take the initiative fighting with them, or is it that you are being, um, you know, they are doing something and you're reacting to it? And I think that the world uh, is going toward uh, being uh, taking the initiative. Uh, we saw it. You know, Israel is kind of a microcosmos of, of fighting against uh, terrorism. The decision in Israel was not to wait for them and then to retaliate. It was to preempt uh, attack. You know, in a way, we could go that we could say that we are going back to the to the history. Don, there's yeah. a word for it: pretaliate. <clears throat> pretaliate. Pre okay, great. <laughs> and uh, so I, th I think that the, the world is uh, going there. 
And uh, this is also, I think, an interesting trend that being proactive against, uh, against uh, those uh, terrorists and not waiting for them and then retaliate. Mr. Owen? Uh, the question <laughs> is, uh, you have a race here. Uh, because uh, technology is available to everyone, so um, even people who are not uh, highly educated uh, can learn how to operate a drone, for instance. Right. One, one of uh, the new problems for drones people uh, at... Uh, challenge, uh, challenge. Challenge at, at, at air defense. <laughs> And it seems as if a highly educated society, such as Israel's, can open the gap even more. Because, of course, one cannot give classified uh, examples. But everyone understands that if the terrorists um, are in their uh, apartments or in their bivouac or wherever, and they have security cameras, if you can slave those cameras from your headquarters, you gain a lot. You can watch them through their own devices. And there are many such uh, uh, examples. And because Israel is um, uh, leading the world in several dimensions of cyber or artificial intelligence, which does a lot to, um, to collect and then uh, disseminate information or to turn information into uh, the finished product, into intelligence, And it can act very, very swiftly. Uh, the whole, the whole uh, um, circle of um, uh, learning, deciding, executing can be done and was shown to be done very quickly. And for that, it doesn't matter if your uh, airplanes are above Natanz or Fodou in <coughs> Iran, assuming they get there somewhere or above Gaza. So what we have seen um, above Gaza is a demonstration, a very, very miniature one, but a demonstration of what the Israeli command and control system can do once it has its sights on a mission. I'd like to go from signal to human or signal intelligence to human intelligence, because when we're looking at uh, the European arena specifically as an example uh, we see in Belgium we see in the UK we see in France we see elsewhere many of the mosques right now have a uh, very clear policy of leave your phones outside when you come in and we're going to communicate directly with you verbally and then we'll see how we can educate you differently many of those children entering their youth entering there are being radicalized and are being uh, of course a challenge then for society not to even uh, communicate about the 3200 or even more that managed to infiltrate Europe following uh, the, the so-called defeat of the Islamic State, even though the ideology is still vibrant and uh, spreading. To what degree do you see this being challenged uh, from Western intelligence agencies that are following the various events in Charlie Hebdo and, and the other areas uh, that, uh, of course, uh, claim the lives of so many innocent civilians in Europe, is this being tackled in a, a concrete way? Intelligence units in general look at things through security eyes, not through the aspect of what you're bringing up right now, Jonathan. What do you need to do in this case? One is to infiltrate it, meaning you want to have somebody in the room listening to what's going on. That's the intelligence aspect. But you want to be able to impact that dialogue. You want to be aware of what is that disenfranchised youth. When I used that term, I wasn't talking about the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. I was talking about Europe. I'm talking about a young generation of people who have moved to Europe for a variety of reasons, not just Muslim, but many of them from these different areas that are being put into a situation where that extreme aspect of this extreme, harsh, jihadi ideology inside those rooms without us being able to listen in is a clear and present danger. I don't think that only the intelligence units are the ones that need to be there. In, I can say that right now, within the European Union as in general, 
within the intelligence community, there's an understanding that this isn't just an intelligence aspect, that you need to be in the room to understand what the threat is, but you also need to be looking at this disenfranchised youth, understanding what it wants in a different way, trying to change its reality so that you don't actually have that challenge to stand against. General Gavish? I think what is important to say is that, uh, and because we were talking about technology and what does the, the, what did what did it bring to the to the fight against uh, terrorism, you meant it's still needed, it's still there. Uh, before we were talking about boots on the ground, the boots on the ground today is a precise boots on the ground. It's more special units. It's more dialogues uh, between humans. Still, still, it's there. So the human aspect is 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 super needed. We add to this toolbox, as in general, of fighting against terror, the cyber fight, for example, which was not there in the last 10 or 20 years. This is a new, completely new arena with the huge capabilities. The AI is also part of it. So the, I think that what we could say is that the, the way of, uh, of dealing with this, the technology enlarge our toolbox, but still, the basics are still needed. The human is still needed. What was said by Mira, I completely agree. It's not only the security point of view. It's it's much broader fight. Uh, there is a there is a society aspect to it. There, there is an econ- economical aspect to it. I mean, when you really fight terrorism, you need to to look at it from a broader mm-hmm. point of view. But uh, you know, going back to to the aspect of technology and and so on, I think that. Today, overall, we are broadening the, the toolbox of uh, fighting against uh, terrorism. And sometimes it's allow us, and uh, not for the US, for example, not to set so many forces in the ground and to do it differently. But human is, is, is the But, is the but where does, where does uh, <clears throat> security and counterterrorism and, and law enforcement start? And this is a problem that in Europe they contend with in other places. And here we are exactly 50 years after the massacre at the Munich Olympics. And when one goes back into uh, the history, into the documents, you see that because of the history of, at that time, the Federal Republic of Germany, so-called West Germany, because they did not want to be so centralized, the various landers at that time, uh, Bavaria, had more power over what happened than the central government which is one reason they failed in their rescue attempts. So when the Israeli government wanted to send a special unit to storm and release the Israeli hostages, they were blocked not by the government in Bonn, but the local government in Munich. Well, we uh, are drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to bring in one more element into this discussion, and that is uh, within the age of strategic competition, considering the fact that countries do use proxies in order to bring about their interests. And we see, of course, Iran as a prime example of utilizing proxies, of providing, equipping those proxies with advanced weaponry, including drones. Were those things bringing us into uh, today's reality? Colonel? When we look at Iran, we are looking at the main supplier for our Middle Eastern arena of not just the capabilities, the weapons themselves, but of training, of understanding of what I call transferring information from these different proxies to each other. What happens in Yemen can pass to Hamas. What happens in Hamas can help out Hezbollah. They know how to transfer that information. And that's done with the background in the backdrop of Iran. But it's not just Iran. We're already getting to the stage, I cannot call Hezbollah a proxy. Hezbollah is not a proxy of Iran. It's supplied by Iran. It's trained by Iran, but it has its own enormous strength. And as such, I very much accept the Israeli definition of a terror army. And I think that Hamas is joining on being a terror army. And I think that within this discussion about terrorism, perhaps what we need to start talking about is not just proxies, but these new terror armies that are growing. And the way that we need to attend with them is both through the visual of security and otherwise. And again, looking at it, both who's the people who are joining it, why is it having such strength, but also how we contend with it like Israel did a week ago. General Gavish. 
I think you brought a very important point because if we're looking on, on the last uh, 10 years, the use of proxies, uh, although I agree with you that some, some of them are today, we could call them terrorist armies, but still the idea of using a proxies, this is something that we see for sure in our arena. I mean, Iran today, they are using the Houthis uh, in uh, Yemen. Uh, of course, they are arming uh, uh, the, the guys, uh, the, the Islamic Jihad in, in Gaza, the Hezbollah, they are in uh, Syria. So one of the ways that uh, really uh, countries, raw countries, let's put it this way, uh, are using uh, the, the terror is by making them their uh, proxy. And this is also, of course, this is a challenge that uh, we have to fight with. So it's not that we are fighting also against the, those proxies or the terrorist organizations. We, are, we have to fight also uh, toward the, the origin of it which is, in our, in our case, of course, it's, uh, it's Iran. And the metaphor of the octopus and the tentacles. Exactly, all exactly course. this. So, uh, so, you know, broadening again, your question is, is that when we fight now to the uh, terror, it's not only the terrorist organization is looking where are the, where are the roots of those uh, terror and how do you fight uh, against them. Uh, and this is also what makes uh, this fight so challenging. We are going so, back to medieval and even pre-medieval times with mercenaries. The, the difference is if you have Afghan militias and similar uh, Shiites uh, on the Golan Heights run by Iran, because even though Iran is a dictatorship, they still don't like to lose their own people on the battlefield. So they use these uh, mercenaries. But these are motivational or motivated mercenaries. They are both ideologically motivated and this is the way to make a living until you stop living. This is a yes or no question because we have about 20 seconds for that. But uh, is the world doing enough in the battle against uh, Islamic terror today, Colonel Eisen? Israel is. Israel is, General Kavish. The, well, the world is going toward uh, mainly United States, uh, but there is, a, there is a way to go. Strong. Well, the world has succeeded uh, partly uh, in fighting Daesh, but uh, we will have to revisit this issue because our time is up. Indeed. Well, this is indeed uh, all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Colonel Eisen, General Gavish, and Mr. Owen for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time for yet another episode of TV7 Jerusalem Studio. Shalom.